Morning, everybody. 11.53, seven minutes more. It's good to see the hall filling up. Uh, that means school holidays uh, is going to be over soon. Today is the last day, right? Tomorrow is a, a very black Monday for many kids. <laughs> Thank God I'm not in that shoe because now every Monday is black for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, but Cam, just to give a heads up, uh, a few days ago, our, uh, uh, the, the agent that services us to get a hotel in Malaysia for our church camp came down, we spoke, and of course we have confirmed the site. Uh, we're going to have our church camp next year, June, third week of school holiday, just going to count off third week school holiday, we'll be there at uh, Sunway Putra, uh, and the hotel that's annexed to uh, Putra uh, Shopping Centre, not too far away from uh, Mid Valley, so uh, it'd be great fun. Uh, it'd be great time meeting up with God, encountering Him. Great time for family, for cell, uh, recreation that we all need uh, in a busy life uh, in Singapore. So um, book your date. We're in the process of uh, inviting speakers and all. All right. Um, today I'm going to share with you. You see on the screen. Uh, principal descriptions of uh, discipleship and the passage I've taken uh, this message from will be John 21, 1 to 22. I propose that we read this together. Uh, never, never any harm when we read uh, the scriptures, so I hope they can follow and sometimes even the words that I may not be picking up uh, to, to share with you, sometimes God can speak to you. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias and in this way, he showed himself. Uh, Simon Peter, Thomas, called twin, uh, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and uh, two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you also. So they went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to, uh, to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his uh, garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in uh, the little boat, for they were not far from land, uh, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals uh, and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have caught, just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples there asked, Who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. Now, this is how the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after the, he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, uh, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than this? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then he said, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I said to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wish. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. He spoke this, signifying by which, what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, the disciple who was, had leaned on his breast at, at supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing this disciple, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? 
Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. That's the word of the Lord. Let's pray together and ask God to prepare our hearts to receive his word. Father, we want to um, uh, commit ourselves to you, and we're just thankful that we can gather around the table uh, and have this spiritual nourishment from you. Uh, Father God, we know that you're the head of the table. You're feeding your children, and we come asking you to feed us. Uh, make your word come alive, uh, that your word uh, would challenge us uh, to go forth and do something great for Jesus Christ, that you will not uh, return to you uh, in vain. So uh, bless us, Lord, and uh, bless your servant. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, and everybody say, Amen. Let me give an introduction. Uh, uh, Simple Discipleship Church, a series, SDC series. Now, we've been practicing uh, at our church, LSVC, the principles of Simple Discipleship Church for about 10 years now, and discipleship is a, a process. It's like a journey with Christ uh, together with our disciples. So it's your journey with Christ with other disciples. And it has four essentials, namely um, essential Christ, essential cell, essential community, essential commissions. We have for 10 years been practicing this and we have become over familiar with these uh, four essentials. Now, we have discussed at length in recent years trying to um, sharpen this uh, structure, uh, whether we should uh, reduce the number of essential from four uh, to three, or maybe even if we need to resharpen it by increasing from four to five. But we have not finalized it. But the sharpening of focus uh, that ultimately we'll do will not depart from these four um, essential. So the fundamentals are same, but the optics, the, what you can see, optical thing might, might, might be different, all right, to be sharper in focus. Now, right now, in our church, we are into year two of the new period. You know, God led us, you know, from period to period, and we're into a 20-year period. We're now into uh, year, year two. And we need to revisit this very important subject of uh, discipleship. However, uh, we have to overcome this challenge of over-familiarity with this subject. So when I say that we're going to talk on discipleship, it's, you're so, it's so familiar that straight away there's a lot of inertia, a lot of resistance, and we have to overcome it. You know? Because over-familiarity breeds contempt. You hold this subject in contempt. Therefore, uh, as we were planning for this series, uh, we decided that we should recast. We recast the essential uh, in a mini-series of six messages that we are entitled Descriptions of Discipleship, meaning it, it answers this question, how, how does this, the discipleship look like? Uh, not theoretically, but it, when it's being lived out, how does it look like? Can we describe it? So we came up with four descriptions. Now, we had hoped that by representing the essentials of simple discipleship uh, in, a, uh, in this way, it becomes... Uh, very fresh, and that it will be very refreshing uh, to you. So basically, that's our objective, and I hope that we can achieve it. All right, just uh, to let, see, let you see the coherent whole picture, um, the topical outline that we've done so far. May 1st, we started this series, and I preached on a principle of Simple Discipleship Church, followed by 8th May, Discipleship is Personal, that's the first P, by our DSP, Melvin, 15 May, discipleship is participative. Pastor Zachary spoke on that. Uh, 22nd May, discipleship is painful. Uh, other Chris Co shared with us. And then 29th May, discipleship is powerful. A, a district pastor, Rute, shared. So today, 22nd, 26th June, uh, I am doing a roundup. Right? Now, let me tell you the key thoughts for today. Um, I will not review. I will not summarize the preceding four messages uh, by the four speakers. And if you miss any of them, you want to revise any of them, you can listen, uh, go into our website, uh, go to our uh, uh, sermon archive, and you can listen to any or all of them, right? But I want to assure you that in my roundup today, I will not repeat what you heard or what you can hear uh, in those four messages, uh, nor will I contradict 
what my colleagues have, have been uh, preaching. Okay? Now, in order to achieve certain coherence so that uh, it can hold everything together in, in a message, in this rounding up, uh, I thought I would just use one passage instead of four passages to round up four thoughts. I use one. Uh, then it helps to give us a coherence. Um, and so the, the one passage I want to deal with is actually John 21, 1 to 22. I will refer a little bit of John 20. So actually, like, it's like one, one passage, and we just focus on it. And the, the, the two chapters, uh, 20 and 21 of John, uh, record a certain stage of the discipleship journey of Peter and the rest. You know, if the discipleship journey, you know, it started with Christ calling them, and then they three years with Christ, uh, there was a certain stage. And this is a particular stage that we're going to look into. It, uh, it was a very difficult stage, right? We'll see later on. It was a difficult stage, to say the least. But they uh, had not given up the discipleship journey. They were still at it. Yeah, it was difficult. So that's the background. Now, the key thoughts I want to share with you are four altogether. Number one, to talk about uh, the personal care that we receive in our discipleship journey because discipleship is personal. So this is a different angle I'm taking. Number two is that uh, in discipleship journey, there will be, to each one of us, a pastoral call. Uh, and Pastor Zach was sharing about being participative from a different angle. Then the third one, I'll be sharing you about a presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit for change in our life. Uh, Pastor Ruth was talking about the uh, discipleship uh, is powerful huh, because of the Holy Spirit. And then lastly, uh, pain and the cross, a small cross, cross that we have to carry. And that is, um, discipleship is painful. So I'll be covering these four. The original intention is that today, I will finish all four. But by the time I finish coming here, this, uh, I say cannot, lah. I think uh, maybe two. So we'll have two today and two next week. Is that okay? Uh, then you can end on time. But sad to say, this morning I only finished one. All right, yeah. Uh, so good news for you because I do one, we're going to go off very early, and the misiam is still there. Yeah. I, well, I eat and say, Praise the Lord, it's so short. You know? Okay, so we'll, we'll just only do one, but you listen carefully because it's one thought. It's very easy to remember, easy to carry, and may the Lord warm your heart. Number one, personal care in discipleship. I want to talk about uh, the relationship with Jesus and with others. In John 21, the passage we just read, uh, Jesus said to Peter two times, follow me. Now, that was not the first time actually that Jesus uh, told Peter to follow him. The, the first time that Jesus called Peter to follow him occurred at the start of Peter's discipleship journey recorded for us in Matthew chapter 4. 18 to 20, and I, I won't read that. You can go back and read Matthew 4. Uh, at that time, Peter responded to Jesus on a personal basis, even though Jesus spoke to Peter and his brother Andrew uh, at that time. You see, the discipleship must begin, always begin with the believer's personal response to Jesus' call to follow him. Right? All of us have had that call, uh, to follow him, and when we respond, that journey starts. It is not a mass call, like a university graduation or like a, uh, hundreds of lawyers being called to the bar. You know? Not a mass call, uh, but it's a very personal invitation from the Lord himself. And the person called to discipleship then has got to make a decision uh, for himself. You know, he, he ca it cannot be left for, to others to decide. You know, if your son, you cannot say, let my dad decide. If my dad says, can I decide? Or, or so forth. Or if your wife say, depends on my husband. God will call you and then you personally must take responsibility to make a decision. Now, the call to follow Jesus leads to a lifelong journey with Jesus. Just remember that, so you have a journey with Jesus. What sort of journey? Uh, it is not a journey that links two persons, Jesus and you, who happen to love travel 
Let's like go to Japan, Korea, uh, Taiwan. So let's journey together. Lah. We, we share the interest. It, it's not a journey linking two persons who happen to love walking, hiking, or whatever. It is a, a journey between the disciple and Jesus. And in a loving, personal relationship. And you must re remember that. You, you don't just come to Jesus and journey with Him because, incidentally, we have this shared interest. It is because of a relationship with Him that is a personal and that's a, a loving relationship. He is your Savior and He's your friend. That is the type of relationship that you talk about when you talk about discipleship journey together. You're not just a, a, a number in a crowd. Huh? This church, 1,000 APL, you are one of them. It's not, it's not that. You're not called to make a commitment uh, to share some interest. Anyone who's interested to travel, make a decision. Anyone who's interested to hike, it's not that. Uh, but you're called to follow Jesus in a loving relationship with Jesus as your saviour and friend. So remember that you are not called to an organisation, to a denomination, to, because you love community penetration, but you're called to a relationship. You're going to respond to a relationship. And it's a very special relationship. It's a loving relationship. And it is a relationship that is loving because you are personally cared for by Jesus. And that is very, very important, all right? Uh, and this uh, personal care uh, by Jesus is appreciated, is to be experienced, especially in time of our need. Let me say more about this. The description of uh, this relationship is not rhetorical. Uh, it's not just a cliche. But it is a real relationship. Not rhetorical, not just word, but real. Meaning, it is a heartwarming relationship to be experienced. You have to experience it. Your relationship with Jesus is heartwarming. You must experience it. It's not because I say so. This is most appreciated when we are lost and in doubt, right? And Jesus will extend to us his personal care in times of our lostness, in times of our doubt, and that is a time when we really appreciate, wow, this personal care is so real. All right, let me just tell you more about this personal care. By personal care, I mean Jesus would come and attend to you personally. He will be there for you. He will come to you intentionally and not incidentally. You know, when, when someone come and drop by and say, oh, so nice to have you visiting me. I feel so touched by you. Uh, then I say, sorry, huh? I, I, I visit the guy next door, then I notice you're nearby. So I drop in like, incidentally. Straight away, your value drop, right? <laughs> but I say, I come all the way. You know, you're in Tuas. I come from Aukang all the way to see you. So I'm so touched on SP, right? But if it's incidental, you know, Jesus come is not, not incidental. It's really intentionally just for you. And you feel that, wow, this is a personal touch. It's, it's, it will be done specially for you. You feel so valued. Uh, you feel so treasured. And you can read this in the passage we have here. Uh, now, in this narrative, we find the disciple Jesus, uh, Peter, all right? He was lost. He was lost in terms of his future direction uh, in life. And number two, he was also struggling with self-doubt. And therefore, he was in need of help in these two areas. Let me tell you how come he get into this state of uh, need. You see, Peter was called by Jesus to be a fisher of men at the start of his discipleship journey. He responded. He responded by leaving his vocation, left his net, left his uh, fishing gear, left his partners, and followed Jesus to be a fisher of men. But how was that early call panning out at the time of John 21? How was it doing? Well, Jesus was no longer with them physically, in person, as a team leader. And so we find Peter returning to the fishing vocation. The other six disciples followed uh, him. Uh, they had lost their direction in life. I mean, whether it was uh, very long or short, but at that moment, there's no direction. The leader is gone. What will happen next, they do not know. Um, the other thing was, Peter was also struggling with self-doubt. 
after denying Jesus. Three times the night of Jesus' arrest and trial. Jesus did not speak to Peter about the incident after, uh, even when he met Peter in the first appearance after his resurrection, the second appearance, he, uh, he, Peter was there, right? First time, second time. And there was no mention that uh, Jesus brought up the subject with Peter. Say, said, Peter, come here, come here. Remember, on the night you betray me, I want to talk to you about it. But he kept quiet first time. Second time, kept quiet, all right? And it remained an unresolved issue that was gnawing at the heart of Peter at a material time in John 21. Let me say something about such a matters, all right? It's quite common among us. In some matters in life where we have erred, we have been corrected by friends, uh, we feel very awkward. And between ourselves and our friend and our other party that have this issue, and the issue may have been over resolved, but awkwardness comes in between us. Why? Because we allow silence to separate us from our friends who corrected us or that we have this issue. It's no longer a life issue, but there is a silence that separates us from our friends. Silence creates barrier, and that increases the awkwardness. So, so it just go on. And that's why sometimes over a small matter, unresolved, we begin to lose friends. Friends that we don't speak to one for 10 years, 20 years, 15 years. It's not an exaggeration. You have gone through that. And we, we, actually what we need to do is just talk about it. A talk and then to break it, uh, break that silence and bring people together, remove the awkwardness. And you see, there, there was this awkwardness, this unresolved matter between Peter and Jesus. And Peter sorely needed a personal touch from the Lord. And Jesus did that. Personal visit and loving words. Let's move on. Now, Jesus paid a special visit with the seven disciples. It was such a heartwarming visit filled with personal care. All right? The, the loving thoughtfulness of Jesus cannot be missed. You read that, your conclusion, wow, Jesus, so thoughtful, you know, so loving. Uh, and such personal visits occurs in our relationship too, uh, our, our disciples' journey. I mean, we, we, we have ups and downs, and when Jesus visits us on those occasions, I tell you, usually it is so heartwarming to be visited by the Lord Jesus. Why I say so? Now, Jesus called out to the disciples. He was ashore, the disciples in a boat, about 200 cubits away, and uh, he said, my children, no, so quote, unquote, my children. Now, the, the root word for this children is uh, paideon, which means an infant or a half-grown boy or girl. All right? That means little boy, little girl. And Jesus is like, uh, Jesus calls, hey, come on, little guys, come over. Or, or uh, do you, have you caught anything? Now, Jesus called seven grown-up fishermen little boys. Was it an insulting term or was it an endearing term? Right? You know, in Chinese, uh, we, when we had the baby come, we call te kia, te kia. Actually, the, you know, te, uh, te is a very bad word, right? But when you call te kia, it's very endearing. Right? So sometimes it's like that. Children is a very endearing thing. I believe Jesus deliberately used the word in an endearing way. It was very heartwarming. It was such a loving address by Jesus to the seven grown-up disciples. I tell you, it does not matter how old you are, but we can be embraced by Jesus like little child. And the effect, I tell you, is magical. If Jesus comes to your life, and he just embraced you, you as a little child, the effect is magical. I love it. Uh, I always ask God to embrace me like I'm a child. That's why I love to read Psalms 131, uh, verse 1 to 2. Let me put on the screen and we read together. Psalms 131 said, Lord, the psalmist say, uh, it could be you. You can say this prayer. It could be me. I, I mean, I, I, I love to say this prayer. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Well, because I... 
I'm, I'm not proud, you know, that I, I'm a grown-up, a senior pastor, I've got position in life, I'm a rich man, I, I'm, I'm not proud, I, I'm not lofty looking at all the big things. Neither do I concern with, with myself with great matters, all the responsibility, all the concern, all the agenda, no, no, things are too profound for me that some of the things I don't even understand. All these things, I put it aside. I just want to calm myself, quiet my soul, like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. That is what I want. That when I come to God, I just drop everything, all the titles, all the responsibility, all the uh, things that weigh upon me, you know, the haughty thing in life, all right? and just come as a child, and like a weaned child. Right? The person just finished suckling uh, milk. Would you like to hear Jesus calling you, my child, how are you? Fear not, fret not, trust me. And, you know, I, uh, from time to time, I, I need ministry myself, and very often is when worship is on because you don't get the chance to be prayed for uh, by people. And as a senior pastor, you pray for others, people will pray for you. And uh, when I, I ask God to minister to me, very often I ask God uh, to just shower me with His love like a father would to a child. I would say, uh, Father God, this is your child, uh, in your presence, needing you to embrace him. So that's my habit. And it is this picture where God can embrace me as a child. That can forget I'm a senior pastor. All right? Recently, I highlighted this truth to my brother-in-law as he embarked on his discipleship journey at a time of critical health challenge. He was unwell and then... Uh, very sadly, he passed on shortly after that. And I remember just teaching the truth. You know, because he's, he's a big who is who in the marketplace, the chairman, founding of uh, an uh, investment fund. He's very smart, etc. And then he came to Christ, and I, I just emphasized this relationship. See, this is your relationship. You're a father. We come, leave aside all these things, and come as a child and call to father and call him to help you. I remember that night, um, just before he died, I was in the ICU, and uh, the court family called me and said, please come, come and speak to him, comfort him. Uh, I went in, I spoke into his, you know, his ear and his spirit, and I repeated him again. I said that, uh, you know, you, remember I told you, you're a child of God, you're just a little child, leave everything and just come to him as a child. The Father is there, call upon his name. And he'll hold you, he'll embrace you, he'll not for one moment forsake you, etc. And I believe that he was very greatly comforted. And I think we need that type of comfort very often. Uh, we do, I want to tell you, you come to God, you do not come with all the title to impress Him. In fact, you can come and say, Lord, strip me and treat me like a little child. I just want you to embrace me, to just shower me uh, with your love. This showering thing, you know, if you are sensitive, uh, to, to sensation, manifestation. Uh, and I'm not that sensitive. But quite often, when I ask God to shower me, I will have the bathing sensation. That means the, you get all this tingling down, it's just like water going... Rrr, rrr, rrr. So it's, it's very assuring <laughs> that God, God is showering me with His love. Okay? And in your discipleship journey, when I talk about the personal care. I'm talking about this. This, when God can make special visits and God as He address you is like this loving address to a child. Then, that's not all. He can, personal care can also be expressed in work, in your disappointment and in provision. Let's move to that one. Now, Jesus took interest in the work of the disciples, the, the, the fishing. He took interest. Uh, he could have waited for another time when they would not work, you know, when they were at home, and then go in just at like the second, uh, the first and second visit. Why, why at that place? Well, he was interested in the work. He was also interested in their disappointment. He asked the relevant question, have you any food? Now, why did Jesus ask that question? Not because 
Jesus wanted to eat eat tamjiam. Uh, no, he already had the food there. When he asked, it was he was interested in their work, uh, and he prepared a meal for them. Fantastic! No? Jesus prepared a meal for them. Do you know that there's there is no better way of showing care for people you love than, especially when they're cold, hungry, and disappointed, than to lay out food for them. So the ministry of food uh, is very important. All right? When someone comes and visits you and gives you food, you feel very encouraged. Uh, yesterday, a dear brother came when I was so pressurized preparing sermon, uh, so abandoned by you people. Uh, you know, you all enjoy and I go and prepare, prepare, prepare. And then he came with a box of durian. Wow. So well, immediately, uh, inspiration came. The, the sermon became longer. You know? uh, <laughs> There is a dear friend, who, uh, Joseph Chen, I, he speaks at our church once a year. This year is coming also. Uh, uh, now, now he's leading Antioch 21. And fantastic cook. He's the only member in the Love Singapore community, and I'm in, where from time to time, every six months or so, he'll organize uh, a lunch in his house. And lunch, he will cook. Cook all the meal and get about six of us. I mean, those COVID days are about times eight, and then one time five. Uh, and, we'll, and it's cooked, prepared by him. And it's so heartwarming. And he was sharing with us that that's how God taught him. When he go on a mission trip, sometimes he get to a very difficult situation, can't break through, can't get through with the uh, local pastors. He was telling me at one time he was in Okinawa, he just couldn't get through to the Japanese pastors because he was, they, they, they didn't quite know him. Then he then said that, okay, you come to the place where he's giving, I'm going to prepare a meal for you. And he prepared a meal for the Japanese pastor. After the meal, everything, bole, can, huh? aligato already. Uh, and there is this, this ministry of the meal that is important. Huh? I think we should exercise uh, more of it. Huh? You can call me. Yeah. <laughs> but let me tell you something else. In the event, he provided more than just a meal. Jesus would not just come and give a meal, meal in the sense of a spiritual refreshment, a spiritual nourishment, a spiritual encounter, that type of meal. Uh, something could be an actual meal sent through a brother, a sister. But he, he actually, he did more than that. He intervened with a miraculous catch. Uh, he said, cast a net on the right side and you will find some. Not much, uh huh? Tampo, some. I'm always amused by the word, this word, uh, when I read the passage. The word some, the word used by Jesus. It must be the most understated word ever. Why? Jesus said some fish, but actually the disciples were not able to draw in the net because of the multitude of fish. Multitude, that's the description there. And when they finally brought the net to land, they counted one, five, three big fish, not ikan bilis, you know, uh, not kong leng here, but it's like maybe tuna, huge one. And he said, some, I give you some fish. It is a picture of God's provision for his children, those seven people, God's provision for us. They went back to work as fishermen and caught nothing. Jesus called them back to ministry in that time uh, and gave them so much fish they could hardly handle. God's provision is abundant. To us, the provision is abundant. When you see it, wow, I asked for, some, I expected some fish and there's abundance. But to God, it's sub sub soy. You know, you know sub sub soy. Uh, I mean, not all of us are. Country not ours, uh, uh, Chinese, that uh, we have got some brothers here, Indian brothers with us. Sub, sub soy means small change, small little thing. And it was when, when God gave to the disciples that, that catch, 153, the net that was, they couldn't put in, to him, sub sub soy la. But the disciples said, wow, it was a miraculous catch. 
Why is God doing this? This sub sub sweet thing, you know. He can do greater things than that. He can do greater things than a net so full up that you can hardly draw in. He can do greater things than the 153. To him, bring in some sub sub soy fish that you may see. God's measure of provision is just some. That was his measure. To him, but to us, overwhelming. Have you experienced that before? Have you experienced abundant provision beyond your wildest imagination? Let me tell a story. I remember when I was in my early primary school days, maybe I was in primary one, primary two, so small fella, small boy, and uh, my uncle from Hong Kong visited with us. Um, and then came to the house, stayed with her. And my uncle, of course, a very, very rich man. Uh, and, but my dad uh, was very poor. And of course, we were, we were so, so, so poor. More than I got no money with me. And I remember on the day before he departed, he got a lot of, a lot of coins. One whole bunch of coins. Was, the, all the adults were talking. I was, a, I was a little boy nearby with my granny, and they were all talking. And my uncle was playing with lots of Singapore coins. I mean... He, he can't bring Singapore coin back to Hong Kong, right? So I just looked and looked and waited and said, oh, I say, man. Huh? And in my heart, I, I, I was longing. I said, if my uncle can give me a coin, it will be a big thing. And I was, ho- ho- I was thinking that maybe he would just take and say, hey, Ayong, that's my name, uh, Chua Tong Yong. Ayong, you take. Uh, and say, would it be a five cents? Would it be a 10 cents? Would it be a 20 cents? God, if you give me 50 cents, it would be a great thing for me. I mean, 50 cents would be a great thing because 50 cents was a big deal. Uh, for 40 cents, I could go on for a fantastic weekend swim at River Valley Swimming Pool. I needed 5 cents to take a bus trip from Alexander Road to River Valley Road and another 5 cents to come back. That's 10 cents, all right? Uh, actually, it cost 10 cents to travel there, lah, but I pay five cents because I get off before the fast stage. Uh, before from five cents go to ten cents, I quickly get out and walk, uh, save five cents. You must think, you know, because it's so little money. And then you pay 15 cents to get into the pool, and then you, you pay ten cents for a big koropo. The koropo is a big one, like that one. Oh, that's ten cents. So uh, go canteen, you buy. And uh, that would total 45 cents and I got 5 cents to spare but it would be a great thing for me and that night I looked at my uncle if he could give me 50 cents he noticed me looking for this 50 cents and he said Ayong all give you <laughs> so many 5 cents it was overwhelming to me to him sub sub soila and then he's a Cantonese. I mean, he speaks Cantonese. He's a Teochew. Hong Kong. This is some, some, so you do it. Our God, when he gave us some, say, Dad, Daddy God, give me some. I need help. And then he come, that some he gave us is overwhelming. The Father God, sub, sub, so Meaning what? He can do much more yeah, for you. This is the, this is our personal care we talk about. You know, that incident happened 67 years ago. I can remember it very vividly. Why? It impacted me as a small boy. To my uncle, it was subsequent. To me, it was a miracle. It was abundance. Can you think of occasions in your life, in your Christian life, when you experience setbacks, setback with your work, with your career, with employment, and you felt so disappointed. Sometimes a lot of us put in so much effort, sacrifice so much, and, and then, you know, we are not rewarded. In fact, you know, we don't get promoted. Or, or some, things happen. Uh. And then at the same time, you're worried, worried about your financial situation, you know, and things like that. And then you, you just pray, God, no, I need some provision. And come, God, come true, provide. It's, it's like an abundance, you know. It's an, it's an abundance for you. But the way he does it is as a nonchalant way. 
uh, and it is a way of expressing his personal care for you that he can do much more. He's capable, able to do much more. And today, if you're in that situation, go back to this God. This God that will, is well able to personally meet this need. Right? So, to the seven disciples, it was a very poignant reminder of the occasion of their original call to follow Jesus. When a similar miracle catch happened, and Jesus was actually repeating this miracle to reaffirm his calling to them to be fisher of men. Uh, it was a good spiritual direction resetting for them. And we need that from time to time. We, always, we have uh, spiritual experiences. And that occasion that is very clear to us, God did a miracle set of direction. And then things went through. We go through rough time. We have forgotten it. And we're in a state where we're totally forgotten and we are lost. And God, in a way, repeat a situation there. The way he dealt with it, the way he provided, I said, hey, that was happened many years ago. God is doing it again. And it's a reminder. It's a resetting. That, that is a direction that God wants you to go. Is God doing that in your life right now? There's something happening but God is intimidating to your prayer. And it really resembles those days. Don't, don't miss it. It's a resetting for you to come back. God reaffirming that He can. He can do it for you. Finally, personal care in mutual affirmation. I think the most touching aspect of the encounter that morning by the Sea of Tiberias was the personal ministry extended by Jesus to Peter. Now, what he did was this. Jesus created the opportunity for Peter to affirm his love for Jesus three times. The thrice repeated affirmation of love for Jesus helped erase Peter's sense of failure for or always denial of Jesus. And do you know that it's a great, it is great to be given the opportunity to make up you know, sometimes it, it, there's a tip between you and me and then, well, we sort of forgotten about it, no more issue, but, you know, there's something underlying and we couldn't get back together to reaffirm that relationship, to affirm friendship, etc. And then something is created that it clicks and there was an opportunity to reaffirm. And I tell you, it's so freeing, uh, it's so healing. And Jesus does not need a makeup. Jesus wasn't angry. He doesn't need Peter to make it up. But Jesus knew Peter needed this sense to make up to Jesus. And so he created it uh, to, uh, to allow Peter to make up to the Master. And we need the encouragement we get from making up. Once there's a breach of relationship with Jesus and you go into a cold war and you just couldn't get back to God, uh, and the longer it is, the more difficult it is. And then one day God just created an opportunity to say, you can come. I've got no problem. Uh, uh, I, I don't want you to make up with me, but I will allow you to make up for your own sake. And there you are. You say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, you know that I love you. And then it will break. You know, that that uh, awkwardness, strangeness, and distance will break. We call the congregation from time to time, for ministry. Come forward here uh, at the end of message. And the ministry time actually creates opportunity for you to encounter Jesus. It creates opportunity for Jesus to speak to you personally and for you to speak to Him in response and the altar area. Sometimes it requires nothing more than just for you to come forward to affirm your love for Jesus and occasion for you to say, Jesus, I love you. You know, that, that you have been silenced for so long. I just don't know when I can really say it, but now I say it. Thank you for loving me. Sometimes it is no more than asking God to embrace you and to shower His love upon you. So, I just want you to know that the personal care in the discipleship journey that we experience uh, is like that. Something that you can experience, all right? Now, on top of that, that's not all. I'm going to finish already. Yes. 
Uh, on top of that, Jesus repeatedly affirmed Peter by entrusting his sheep to Peter. Uh, Jesus was saying to Peter, okay, Peter, I'm trusting you uh, uh, to take care of uh, others who belong to me. You know why? Because I trust you. I still trust you. I have not written you off. And it's very reaffirming because sometimes we think that we're disqualified, right? You backslide, you do things that you think God is not happy, etc., and then you're disqualified. So God just come and say, I still trust you. And that is very, very healing. So today, some of us just need that personal care from Jesus in our discipleship journey. Some of us need spiritual direction setting. Some of us need that provision. Some of us need that personal affirmation from Him. I think Jesus is here personally to do it, to make it happen for you. So as we end, uh, and uh, we're going to get the worship team to come forward, uh, we're going to uh, sing this closing song, and then I will then create the opportunity for those who come to come and have this encounter and uh, speak to the Lord, the Lord, speak to you uh, and experience what I've been talking about all morning about this. That's okay? Okay. So, um, the worship team is not here yet. Yeah. God didn't provide worship team. No way. <laughs> Let's all bow our prayer together first. Okay. Let's quieten our hearts and uh, where you are, actually, you can speak to him and then tune in and allow him to speak to you. That the discipleship journey is about a relationship that's so loving and that it can be experienced in such a heartwarming way, especially in time of our need. So are you at a point of need that you need to experience that encounter from a loving saviour and friend that you're journeying with? Let him minister to you, creating opportunity for you to affirm your love, creating opportunity for him to affirm your calling, the direction for you, and the assurance of provision. Do it then. Father, speak to your people. And let each of us, O oh God, experience that heartwarming, loving kindness of yours today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think we should all stand. We get um, James to lead us in his closing song. We just want to create an opportunity. Those of us who really want to come forward for, uh, to have that encounter with God, just come and also our, our elders and pastors will pray with you. Is that okay? Uh, it'll be a short one and then we just create an opportunity. Yeah, Jim, go. And His love is coming over, over me, me Softer than the breeze Warmer than the sea. Okay, also it's open, and uh, if you need to, just come forward. We'll get people to pray with you right in front, up here. Cleansing all my sins, lifting up my grief. Yeah, come on, 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 come or elders or leaders just stand with them so that at the close of the song when they can hear better they can start praying thank you for your love that sings with me through the lonely times you believe in me and I 
Together. Father, thank you for your assurance of your deep, deep love, the unconditional love for us. And we pray that as ministry takes place later on, there'll be a personal word for each one of your children up in front. I know that you have spoken to your people in the congregation. Lord, dismiss us today with the uh, triple blessings of the triune God, the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the help of the Holy Spirit. Let this blessing be upon us today and abide with us forevermore. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say, Amen. Bless you. <laughs>